Hello, welcome back to the History Sphere. My name is Greg, I am your host. What you're about to hear is part three of a multi-part series on the decline and fall of the Soviet Union. If you have not heard the first two parts, I suggest you go back and listen to those now. Otherwise, you're going to be missing a lot of context for this episode. Last week, we covered the Russian Revolution of 1905 and the February Revolution of 1917. We left off with the arrival of Vladimir Lenin in Petrograd, where he rallied people to the Bolshevik cause with his calls for peace, land, bread, and all power to the Soviets. This is The End of History, Part 3. At 10 o'clock in the morning on November 7th, 1917, October 25th by the old Julian calendar, which Russia still used at this time, Vladimir Lenin broadcast a message to the citizens of Russia from aboard the cruiser Aurora in Petrograd Harbor. The message read, quote, The provisional government has been deposed. State power has passed into the hands of the organ of the Petrograd Soviet of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies, the Revolutionary Military Committee, which heads the Petrograd proletariat, and the garrison. The cause for which the people have fought, namely, the immediate offer of a democratic peace, the abolition of land ownership, workers' control over production, and the establishment of Soviet power, has been secured. Long live the revolution of workers, soldiers, and peasants. End quote. In fact, the provisional government was not yet deposed when the message was broadcast, but by that evening, it would be. The October Revolution, also known as Red October, the dream that Lenin had single-mindedly worked to realize for decades, was underway. Born Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov in 1870, Lenin was from a solidly upper-middle-class family and had a relatively privileged childhood. His father, Ilya Nikolaevich Ulyanov, was from peasant stock but he had gone to university and become a renowned educator, eventually coming to head public schools in the Simbirsk region, now known as Ulyanovsk, having been renamed in honor of Lenin in 1924. Through his achievements in expanding public education, Ilya Ulyanov was awarded the Order of St. Vladimir by Tsar Alexander III in 1882, which came with a hereditary title of nobility. Blessed with both privilege and intelligence, the young Lenin excelled in school, and he read voraciously. When he was 15, his older brother Alexander left home to study biology at St. Petersburg University. While there, Alexander was exposed to banned leftist revolutionary authors, including Karl Marx, and he fell in with a radical cell of socialist revolutionaries intent on the assassination of Tsar Alexander III. In 1887, this plot was foiled, and Alexander Ulyanov was arrested and executed by hanging. Herein lie the roots of the radicalization of the young Vladimir Lenin. Later that year, Lenin enrolled at Kazan University to study law, and soon fell in with socialist radicals himself, initially identifying with the agrarian socialist SRs, socialist revolutionaries, as his brother did, Lenin soon found himself gravitating towards more traditional European Marxism, viewing the urban proletariat as the primary revolutionary class. After only a few months, Lenin was arrested at a student demonstration against the Tsarist regime, and, having been identified as one of the ringleaders, he was expelled from Kazan University. In 1890, his well-connected mother pulled strings for him to be allowed to obtain his university degree remotely by taking and passing his exams. He received a law degree from St. Petersburg University later that year. In 1892, he moved to St. Petersburg, and began working as an assistant to a local trial lawyer. But he never had any love for the practice of law, and most of his time and attention were devoted to his moonlighting activities as a revolutionary agitator. The sheer volume of Lenin's revolutionary resume during this time is almost impossible to understate, and it can't be done justice in a short podcast such as this one. Suffice to say that he joined multiple underground socialist meeting groups, read socialist theory, and published his own theories on socialism and revolution in numerous underground newspapers, pamphlets, and other illegal publications. In 1895, he was arrested for publishing an underground socialist newspaper, The Workers' Cause, and charged with sedition. Denied legal representation, Lenin denied all charges and refused to confess. 
Not wanting to give him a public trial and therefore an opportunity to give a stump speech, the authorities kept him in prison for over a year without trial, while they worked out what to do with him. While in prison, Lenin continued to write and develop his theories on revolution. Eventually, he was sentenced to three years in exile in Siberia. While in Siberia, he would continue to smuggle his writings out for illegal publication. He also managed to establish correspondence with several prominent Marxists abroad. When his exile in Siberia ended, after a brief residence in the western Russian city of Pskov, Lenin made his way abroad to Western Europe, where he linked up with other members of the Russian Marxist movement, now officially known as the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, and he co-founded the party's newspaper, Iskra, meaning spark in Russian. During this time, he would first meet and develop a friendship with the young Ukrainian Jewish Marxist Lev, often anglicized to Leon Bronstein who went by the revolutionary pseudonym Trotsky. When the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party split in 1902, Lenin emerged as the leader of the Bolshevik faction. He advocated a centrally directed, exclusive party of professional revolutionaries, rejecting populism. Bolsheviks embraced the idea of democratic centralism, essentially that Policies and strategies of the party were to be decided democratically, within the party at least, but once a course of action was decided on, it was the duty of all party members to toe the line and present a united front to the outside world. Lenin spent the next three years drifting around Western and Central Europe, continuing to write, publish, and smuggle his revolutionary literature back to Russia. When the revolution of 1905 broke out, he briefly returned to Russia. In order to take full advantage of the revolution, he thought it necessary for Russian Marxists to present a united front, and therefore he sought rapprochement with the Mensheviks, the other faction of the formerly united Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. He achieved some moderate success in this endeavor, and the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party was briefly reunited in 1906, only to be split again in 1907 over the issue of expropriations. You see, full-time revolutioning wasn't cheap and Lenin's core group of professional revolutionaries required an income to live and fund their revolutionary activities. Somebody had to pay the printer for all those pamphlets. Lenin and the Bolsheviks, therefore, relied on income generated by outright theft conducted by organized gangs on behalf of the party. One young Bolshevik, a Georgian named Joseph Vissarionovich Jugashvili, who went by the revolutionary pseudonym Stalin, proved particularly effective at generating revenue for the party's activities in this fashion. By bankrolling the party's activities with successful heists and bank robberies, Stalin made himself indispensable to Lenin and the other Bolshevik leaders, and he was able to make a name for himself and rise through the ranks of the party in this way. The Mensheviks rejected this tactic, and the reunification of the party was unable to hold. After the 1905 revolution fizzled out, Lenin returned to his self-imposed exile abroad. When World War I broke out in 1914, Lenin immediately saw an opportunity in the crisis of war. He believed that the war between the imperialist capitalist powers would expose the weaknesses of their system and leave them vulnerable to the world socialist revolution he so longed for. He would, in the case of Russia at least, turn out to be right. Lenin was not a Russian patriot. He cared nothing for nationalism. He was an internationalist to his core. He believed with every fiber of his being in world revolution. Unlike the majority of socialists in Europe, Lenin and the Bolsheviks embraced defeatism, the idea that not only should the Russian war effort against Germany not be supported, but that the defeat of Russia was actually preferable to victory. The Tsar, in Lenin's mind, was by far the most conservative and reactionary monarch on the European continent, and his removal was necessary if the socialist revolution was to come about. The defeat of Russia by Germany and the Central Powers made that outcome more likely. When revolution broke out in Russia in March 1917, Lenin was in Switzerland. He knew this was his opportunity and was eager to return to Russia and seize control of the revolution. Unfortunately, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the entire Eastern Front lay between him and his goal. Through some shared connections, Lenin was able to make contact with German intelligence operatives in Switzerland, who made the case to the German high command that Lenin was a worthwhile investment. While it was a long-shot bet, if Lenin was successful in overthrowing the provisional government and taking power, he would almost certainly conclude a separate peace and take Russia out of the war. 
If successful, any investment Germany made in Lenin would pay off a hundredfold. So it was that with German support, Lenin and his inner circle were transported through Germany to Sweden and then across the border to Finland, which was then part of the Russian Empire. He arrived at Finland Station in Petrograd, formerly St. Petersburg, on April 16, 1917, bringing us full circle to where we left off last week. Lenin's true goal was a Bolshevik government and he saw the Soviets of workers and soldiers as the vehicle by which he could seize control of the revolution and realize this desire. He railed against the provisional government, with his demands turned to a slogan, Peace, Land, Bread. He also pushed his position on where the power of the state should lie in post-revolutionary Russia. All power to the Soviets. At this point, it's worth exploring in just a little more detail what the Soviets were. The official name of the Soviets was the Soviets of Workers and Soldiers Deputies. These were directly democratic councils that arose organically among the urban proletarian workers in Russia during the 1905 revolution as leaders and coordinators of the strikes that defined that revolutionary movement. As the 1905 revolution faded, so did the Soviets, but they re-emerged with the 1917 revolution, this time representing not just the proletariat, but also the soldiers. It is important to note that while the Soviets were democratic and that their deputies were elected directly by those they represented, they did not represent the rural peasantry. Thus, they really only represented about 10% of the population of the Russian Empire in 1917, as the vast majority of the population was made up of rural farming peasants. As I mentioned last week, all three major socialist parties were represented in the Soviets, the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks, and the Socialist Revolutionaries, or SRs. The first Congress of Soviets, that is the coming together of representatives from Soviets across Russia, convened in April 1917, just before Lenin's arrival, and it was dominated by the Mensheviks and SRs, with Bolsheviks making up only a minor faction in the Congress. From his arrival back in Russia in April, Lenin's propaganda would take root, and the Bolshevik presence in the Soviets would grow significantly. Average workers and soldiers in revolutionary Russia cared little for the esoteric, doctrinal differences between Bolsheviks and the other socialist parties. They were attracted to Lenin's simple message. They wanted an end to the war, an end to shortages, and power in the hands of the Soviets, which they felt better represented their interests than the provisional government. Whatever his flaws, Lenin's message resonated with them especially among the soldiers, in whose Soviets the Bolsheviks would become particularly dominant in the coming months. That summer, new waves of violence and chaos would break out in Russia's major cities in an event known as the July Days, where armed demonstrators marched to demand an end to the war and all power to the Soviets. The long and short of this is that at this time the so-called Bolshevization of the Soviets was incomplete and the Soviets balked at taking power and assuming responsibility over a country descending into chaos, despite Lenin and the Bolsheviks pushing for them to do just that. Following the July days, members of the provisional government officially alleged that Lenin was a German agent and forced him to go underground. Despite Lenin going into hiding as a wanted fugitive, he continued to agitate, and the prominence of the Bolsheviks and the Soviets would continue to grow until their numbers actually approached a majority. With a second All-Russia Congress of Soviets scheduled to convene in Petrograd from November 7th to 9th, October 25th to 27th by the old Julian calendar, Lenin and the Bolsheviks saw this as their now-or-never moment. On October 23rd, 1917, the Bolshevik Party's Central Committee voted 10 to 2 in favor of forcibly seizing power and deposing the provisional government. Later that day, the Petrograd Soviet, under the leadership of Leon Trotsky, voted to support the armed uprising. Trotsky had initially sided with the Mensheviks when the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party split, but had increasingly gravitated towards the Bolsheviks over the Mensheviks' support for the provisional government. He, like Lenin, wanted all power in the hands of the truly revolutionary Soviets, rather than what he saw as the bourgeois provisional government. Lenin was eager to welcome Trotsky back into the fold. The two had worked together and developed a close friendship while they were both living in exile in London in the early 1900s. Trotsky came from a middle-class Jewish family in central Ukraine. Unlike most Jewish families in Ukraine, the Bronsteins spoke Russian rather than Yiddish at home. And the multilingual Trotsky, who could easily converse in Russian, Ukrainian, 
German, French, and English, never fully mastered Yiddish, speaking it only with difficulty. He was likewise educated in Russian schools in Odessa, where he was often the only Jewish pupil. Yet despite coming from a relative economic privilege and identifying with Russian language and culture, Trotsky was still a Jew, and therefore denied all civil rights and subject to persecution by the Tsarist regime. A situation that radicalized the young Trotsky and led him to gravitate eventually towards Marxism, which rejected not only class, but national and religious distinctions. His career then followed a similar trajectory to Lenin. Revolutionary agitation, leading to imprisonment and exile abroad, and then finally, return to Russia in hopes of joining and steering the revolution. Trotsky was about ten years Lenin's junior, and Lenin saw in him a sort of protege. Indeed, it is the consensus among historians that Lenin expected Trotsky, not Stalin, to succeed him as leader of the Soviet Union. Following the vote of the Bolshevik Central Committee and the Petrograd Soviet in favor of an armed rebellion, the Bolsheviks spent the next several days laying the groundwork and making plans. They convinced several elite military units to support them, most notably the sailors of the Russian Baltic Fleet, which was anchored at nearby Kronstadt Island. Finally, on November 7th, the cruiser Aurora steamed into Petrograd Harbor and, as it broadcast Lenin's message announcing the revolution from its radio room, turned its guns on the Winter Palace. Simultaneously, the Bolsheviks and the soldiers who supported them seized the strategic rail lines, radio and telegraph stations, and other strategic points and lines of communication around the capital. Finally, that evening, the Bolsheviks stormed the Winter Palace and arrested most of the members of the Provisional Government. Only the Prime Minister of the Provisional Government, Alexander Kerensky, had managed to escape, fleeing the city in a car borrowed from the American Embassy. With the deed complete, the transfer of power to the Soviets was presented to the Congress of Soviets for approval. The Congress of Soviets was made up of about 650 deputies, about 390 of whom were Bolsheviks. The second largest party was the SRs, with the Mensheviks making up a smaller, but still significant faction. When the Bolsheviks presented them with power, the Mensheviks rejected the legitimacy of the move, labeling it as an illegal coup. The SRs split over the issue. About 100 of them, who came to be known as the Left SRs, joined with the Bolsheviks in supporting the October Revolution, while the rest of the so-called Right SRs joined with the Mensheviks in opposing it. The Mensheviks and the Right SRs then proceeded to walk out of the Congress in protest. As they walked out, it's reported that Trotsky chided and taunted them, saying, quote, You are pitiful, isolated individuals. You are bankrupts. Your role is played out. Go where you belong from now on, into the dustbin of history, end quote. With the opposition gone, the Congress of Soviets voted overwhelmingly to ratify the October Revolution and left the Bolsheviks as the dominant party in a two-party revolutionary socialist state. The Bolsheviks and left SRs then formed a coalition government, with Lenin at its head. Simultaneously with the revolution in Petrograd, Bolsheviks also seized control of Moscow, and the other large Russian cities. Lenin had been written off for much of his life as a myopically single-minded idealist, but once he was in power, he actually proved to be a remarkably practical man. As I mentioned before, what Lenin really wanted was a Bolshevik government, not a Soviet government. But for the time being, he realized that he didn't have the political capital to push through a Bolshevik agenda, that is, nationalized industry, collectivized agriculture under state control, things like that. Instead, he set about delivering on the promises he had made in the lead-up to the revolution and ingratiating the common people to his government. He handed control of the factories to workers. Rather than immediately centralizing, he left them under control of decentralized workers' councils. He borrowed a land reform policy from his left SR partners that rather than collectivizing the peasants under state-controlled collective farms, as Stalin would later do, decentralized and created an agrarian form of socialism in which large estates by large landowners were broken up and handed over to local peasants Soviets, who would then divide the land and break it up among the local peasantry and distribute it equitably. This was a wildly popular land redistribution program in contrast to the Bolshevik platform calling for the central collectivization of agriculture, which was wildly unpopular. Lenin, being very practical, understood that 
and rather than forcing through his own Bolshevik policy, he adopted the policy that was pushed forward by the left SRs that were partners in his government at this time. And he immediately set out to make good on his promise of peace and attempted to make peace with Germany, an effort that would prove much more difficult than he thought. A mere five days after the Bolsheviks seized power, Alexander Kerensky returned. Having escaped the capital on November 7th, he returned to the outskirts of Petrograd on November 12th with an army of about 1,000 Cossacks at his back. Originally formed from bands of runaway serfs on the peripheries of Muscovy during the late Middle Ages, the Cossacks had come to terms with the Tsars during Russia's late medieval period to serve as the shock cavalry troops of the Tsar's army in return for a degree of autonomy within the empire. Fiercely conservative and protective of their elevated status within the old order, many Cossacks feared that the Bolshevik Revolution posed a threat to their way of life. They chose to back Kerensky, and would soon form the nucleus of an important portion of what would become the White Armies in the Russian Civil War. Kerensky rightly surmised that the Bolsheviks and their revolution were unpopular with the country at large, but he failed to understand the degree to which most of the soldiers were either outright Bolshevik supporters or at the very least were indifferent to the October Revolution. Few soldiers, aside from the aforementioned Cossacks, supported Kerensky or the provisional government. Kerensky expected little or no resistance in his march on Petrograd. Instead, the soldiers of the Petrograd garrison and Lenin's Red Guard fiercely resisted and defeated Kerensky's Cossack army outside the city. Some historians count this battle as the first shots fired in the Russian Civil War. Kerensky's brief role in this story was over. He would flee the country and go into exile in France, then the United States, where he died in 1970. In the lead-up to the October Revolution, Lenin had also promised nationwide elections for an all-Russia constituent assembly. And after taking power, he followed through on this promise— Elections were held on November 25, 1917. The Bolsheviks, and basically every other party, were completely trounced in the elections by the right SRs, the socialist revolutionaries who had walked out of the Congress of Soviets in opposition to the October Revolution. The assembly convened in January 1918 for just one day. They met and they elected Viktor Chernov, an old rival of Lenin's, as their leader of the assembly. They then proceeded to pass legislation which proclaimed Russia as a democratic federal republic. In response, the Bolsheviks and their left SR allies simply locked the doors and refused to allow the assembly to meet the next day, effectively dissolving the assembly and for the first time laying bare the authoritarian nature of Lenin's Bolshevik revolution. Trotsky would later write of the dissolution of the constituent assembly, quote, the deputies of the assembly brought candles with them in case the Bolsheviks cut off the electric light, and a vast number of sandwiches in case their food be taken from them. Thus, democracy entered upon the struggle with dictatorship, heavily armed with sandwiches and candles. The people did not give a thought to supporting those who considered themselves their elect, and who in reality were only shadows of a period of the revolution that was already past." End quote. Outside the political class, there was very little reaction to the dissolution of the assembly. Most people were focused on local matters and saw the constituent assembly as something happening far from them that had little impact on their daily lives. Many were quite content with Soviet rule as it had presented itself thus far. The workers had control of their factories, the peasants had their land, and the soldiers would soon get their peace. Towards this last end, Lenin appointed Trotsky as Commissar of Foreign Affairs and sent him to negotiate a peace treaty with Germany and the other Central Powers. The Central Powers attempted to impose harsh terms, what effectively amounted to a complete capitulation on the Russians, which would strip them of all of Ukraine, Belarus, the Baltic states, and the Caucasus. Trotsky at first tried to stall, hoping that the revolution, which all the Bolsheviks believed was coming soon, would come to Germany and negate the need for negotiations. When he ran out of time, Trotsky at first refused to sign the treaty or reinitiate hostilities in a policy he called neither war nor peace. The Central Powers called his bluff and ordered their armies to advance. After the revolution and the promise of peace, rank-and-file Russian soldiers had stood down and mostly abandoned the army for home. 
Russia had virtually no army left to oppose the Central Powers, and was forced to return to the Germans, hat in hand, and sign their punitive treaty. The treaty was signed on March 3, 1918. It was an abject humiliation and surrender that angered Russian patriots and many of Lenin's fellow socialists. The Bolshevik party itself was deeply divided over it. However, it suited Lenin's immediate needs. It ended the war, as Lenin had promised, and kept the Soviet government in power with international recognition. The treaty would be annulled in November 1918, when Germany and the Central Powers collapsed in defeat, ending the First World War and leaving Eastern Europe in chaos. The left SRs, who were still in a coalition with the Bolsheviks and the revolutionary government, strongly objected to the treaty. They saw it as a betrayal of the people, particularly in Ukraine, where they had a large number of supporters. The left SRs would come to favor returning to the war against Germany and transforming it from a capitalist-imperialist war to a revolutionary war to liberate the working classes of Europe, looking to the wars of the French Revolution as their inspiration. Brest-Litovsk, along with disillusionment with the increasingly apparent authoritarian and repressive nature of the new regime, would cause the left SRs to revolt in July 1918 in an attempt to seize power from the Bolsheviks and put the revolution back on what they saw as the right path. This left SR revolt was crushed, resulting in their ouster from the governing coalition and cementing Soviet Russia as a one-party state under the control of the Bolsheviks, who, in 1918, officially rebranded their party as the Communist Party. Hereafter, I will refer to them as the Communists, just know that the Communists are the Bolsheviks, and the Bolsheviks are the Communists. The ideology didn't change, just the name of the party. In the wake of the left SR revolt, the Soviet state under Lenin was at a low point of their security and power. There was a strong feeling that the state was under threat, the revolution was under threat, as the Bolsheviks made no distinction between the revolution and the success of their own party. And so what resulted from the left SR revolt was not only the ouster of the left SRs from government, and the arrest and execution of many leading left SRs, but in general, the events that came to be known as the Red Terror. As after even their own allies had turned on them, the Bolsheviks, now the communists, felt so insecure in their power that they had to eliminate their enemies and any potential threats to their regime. It's impossible to know how many people were killed, or otherwise harmed during the Red Terror as potential enemies of the communist state. It was a lot. The highest numbers that I've seen, which many historians think are exaggerated, are in the millions. It was certainly in the hundreds of thousands. It was a terror that dwarfed the terror of the French Revolution. Lenin himself saw the terror as necessary. He didn't spend too much time questioning the morality of the terror, because to him, being the practical man that he was, whether or not the terror was moral was a separate question that did not need to be addressed. It was necessary to protect the revolution from the counter-revolution, which was all around him. Speaking of threats by counter-revolutionary forces, that brings me to the brewing Russian Civil War. Outside Russia, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk also motivated the Allies to intervene in Russia. The British would send forces to the Caucasus and northern Russia, the French landed a large expeditionary force in southern Ukraine, the Americans sent expeditionary forces to Arkhangelsk in northern Russia and Vladivostok in the far east, where they were joined by the Japanese. The Japanese were the foreign power that sent by far the largest contingent of foreign troops to intervene in Russia. Upwards of 70,000 Japanese troops would be committed to the far east. While the Western Allies were concerned with ousting the Bolsheviks so that they could put a government in place that would reopen the Eastern Front and continue World War I, the Japanese had much more selfish interests in mind. They had hoped to seize a part of the Russian Far East and incorporate it into their empire, something that the presence of American troops in Vladivostok prevented them from doing. 
the American and European powers, while it was seen as a counter-revolutionary movement, that their motivation was to destroy the revolution in Russia, that wasn't really the case, at least for especially for the Americans and the French. Their primary concern was winning World War I. Everything that they did in Russia was seen in the big picture of World War I. And if the Bolsheviks had continued to fight the Germans, I have no doubt that the Allies would have continued to fund money and weapons and supplies to Lenin and the Bolsheviks to fight the Germans. Their concern was defeating Germany. Aside from the British, who would take on a somewhat more active role in fighting the communists, the other Allied expeditions mostly limited themselves to supporting local Russian anti-communist forces though U.S. forces would suffer just over 200 combat casualties in the Russian Civil War. Later, Soviet historiography casts the ensuing conflict, which is known as the Russian Civil War, as the result of foreign intervention, creating an artificial resistance to the revolution with the intent of restoring the Tsarist regime. But the reality is significantly more complicated. The Allied intervention did not create the anti-communist forces on the periphery of the Soviet state, it merely supported forces that formed very organically. And far from being a reactionary movement intent on restoring the Tsar to power, the vast majority of these forces, which would collectively come to be known as the White Armies, were made up of non-Bolshevik socialists and liberal democrats. Arrayed against them were the Reds, as the communist forces would come to be known. As the White movement grew and gained foreign support, Lenin and the communists came to recognize it as a legitimate threat to their regime, and Lenin once again turned to Trotsky to defend the revolution. Trotsky called on the old traditional Tsarist officers to form the nucleus of a million-man Red Army. These officers, obviously politically untrustworthy, would be overseen by a corps of loyal communist political commissars. Conscription would be introduced to fill the ranks of this army. Though there was some resistance to conscription, the vast majority of conscripts were rural peasants who often had no love for Lenin or the communists. By and large, it was successful. Shortages, economic depression, and famine plagued the countryside, and despite their lack of ideological enthusiasm, many men were attracted to the regular meals and regular pay offered by service in the Red Army. The Red Army would never suffer a shortage of manpower, and in the ensuing civil war was able to consistently commit larger armies to the field against the white armies. The Red Army also had the advantage of controlling almost all of the country's heavy industry, located in the major cities of central Russia, which the communists controlled. The Red Army also benefited from strong, centralized leadership and consistent ideological messaging. The white armies, by contrast, were geographically separated from each other, sometimes by thousands of miles, they shared no unified command structure, and they had inconsistent ideological messaging, as the only thing that really unified them was opposition to Lenin and the communists. The white armies also, in some cases, made huge strategic blunders by committing atrocities that alienated large swaths of the population, particularly the brutality of white officers towards the Jews of Ukraine, largely springing from the anti-Semitic perception that communists were actually puppets of a world Jewish conspiracy, alienated the local population, including many of the non-Jewish Russians and Ukrainians who were horrified at the mistreatment of their Jewish neighbors by the white forces. I have made an executive decision for the sake of keeping these introductory episodes brief, not to get bogged down in the military history or the general course of the Russian Civil War. For those who are interested, I would recommend the book Russia Under the Bolshevik Regime by historian Richard Pipes, which was one of my main sources for this episode, and does a pretty good job of summarizing the course of the war in a way that is digestible and understandable. The long and short of it is that by 1919, with World War I over, the Allied nations had lost their appetite for war, and most of the Allied troops in Russia were withdrawn, apart from a small contingent of British troops. With foreign support drying up, the White Armies made one last grand assault to try and take Moscow, to which the Communists had moved the capital in 1918. The offensive ended in defeat, and the ensuing successful Red counteroffensives in 1920 proved to be the culmination of the war. 
By 1921, most of the white armies were defeated, and the Red Army turned to the task of reasserting control over the nations on the periphery of the old Russian Empire that had declared independence in the chaos of the Civil War. The task of forcibly reincorporating these future constituent republics into Soviet Russia proved to be ideologically tricky. You see, back in 1917, in the immediate aftermath of the October Revolution, Lenin and his young Commissar of Nationalities, Joseph Stalin, had together drafted the Declaration of the Rights of the Peoples of Russia, which asserted that one of the core tenets of the revolution was that all the peoples of the Russian Empire had the right to national self-determination. Now that the communists were secure in their power, and such sentiments were no longer expedient, they sought to justify the military conquest of these non-Russian nations of the old Russian Empire. To this end, the rhetorical question then became, who are the legitimate voices of this national self-determination? Were they the nationalist governments dominated by Mensheviks and SRs that had declared independence? Or were the Soviets, dominated by communists, formerly Bolsheviks, representing the workers in the cities of these territories, the more legitimate wielders of national self-determination. Needless to say, in the view of Lenin and Stalin, it was the rival Soviet governments of these countries who were the legitimate expression of the will of the people. The next several years were characterized by military campaigns by the Red Army to invade and consolidate Soviet rule in these countries. In December 1922, the Soviet governments of Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Transcaucasia consisting of the future republics of Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, signed a treaty formally creating the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, or Soviet Union. Central Asia was at first incorporated into the Russian Republic, and would only later be separated into new constituent republics. New republics would also be added by the territorial annexation of the Baltic states and Moldova in the 1940s. With that, we have, three episodes in, finally reached the beginning of the thing whose end I have set out to explain. So, strap yourselves in for a long series. That's everything for today. As always, thank you to the Blake Annex for the use of this studio, and thank all of you for listening. Please follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and the platform formerly known as Twitter. Please also give us a five-star rating and subscribe on whichever podcast platform you are listening on. Next time on the History Sphere, we will cover the rise of Joseph Stalin and his consolidation of power in the new Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day.